Part 2. Gordon Edward Cross. Diary of a Frontline Medic. Reflections 14. Gordon Edward Cross. Ted Neal. While researching the history of the 35th Division and the 134th Regiment on the website maintained by former members and their families, among PDFs of after-action reports, declassified intelligence briefs, and personnel rosters, I happened upon a personal diary titled The Diary of a Frontline Medic, World War II, by Gordon Edward Cross. Amid the reports and unit histories written in a dry, objective tone that I had already come across, Cross's account stood out for its personal nature. Once I'd begun reading, I couldn't stop, finishing it in one long sitting. The diary had been generously posted and shared on the 134th Regiment's website by Gordon Cross's son, William Bill Cross, as an attempt to ensure that his father's experience and his story were not lost to history. I reached out immediately, somehow knowing that Cross's story had to be shared alongside my grandfather's own. There was a breathless quality to it that made it riveting. This is reinforced by the urgent present tense Cross wrote in. This, as it is happening, quality denies us, the readers, any reassurance that the author of these missives, written in situ, even survived. These are no post-fact reflections written in the comfortable distance of the past tense. Gordon's writing put me in Normandy, and onward into the depths of wartime Europe, in a way even my grandfather's account had not. The extraordinary fact that Cross survived, without serious injury, even to the end of the campaign, provided follow-through to the story of the 134th that my grandfather, evacuated after being shot outside St. Lo, could not. The fact that he had served alongside my grandfather in the very same regiment provided me a further window into what Grandpa had experienced. The notion that there's a possibility that Gordon had even been one of the medics who may have tendered to Robert L. Fowler when he'd been shot sends chills across my skin. Cross's eye for detail, his lyrical style, and a temperament that differed in the extreme from my terse grandfather. Gordon's words helped me to see, hear, smell, touch, and taste the harrowing hellscape of the battlefield in a way I never had before. Cross's account is visceral, all the more powerful for its brevity, written almost like a poem. The staccato beat of scene after scene, one close call after another, one glimpse of death followed by another, even more grisly. It compelled me forward to reach the end. Cross's account is fighting and writing at its fiercest. It possesses the searing brilliance of a flare that you can't look away from, even as it burns your retinas and turns your eyes to water. But I read for an even deeper reason. After hearing my grandfather's stories, knowing and working alongside active duty military and retired veterans, I've lived a long time with the knowledge that I don't have what it takes to be a combat soldier on the front lines. While I have worked in war zones in northern Uganda and Afghanistan, and I've witnessed the bloody casualties of street violence in Accra, Ghana, and Nairobi, Kenya, I've been spared the ordeal of real combat. As I mentioned in the first sections of this book, I know my own disposition and temperament are too sensitive, too fragile for the soul-crushing horrors and the heart-rending choices of battle. Hence, my own career path that steered me into roles and careers of caregiving, as a hospice assistant in an orphanage for children with HIV-AIDS, as a teacher in that same orphanage, and eventually as a professional in the public health field. In addition to that, beneath it all has been the firm sense that my first identity is that of a writer, an artist. Not exactly the steel-jawed soldier with a steady hand or a flinty glare. So it was, in Gordon Edward Cross, a medic who had reassured his family that he would be safe while he served from the safety of the X-ray unit, a man who preferred a career performing as a singer or working as a photographer that I identified with. Even in Gordon's compulsion to write his story down on scraps of paper stuffed into his helmet, I could see myself. I had done the same thing as a way of processing my own traumas in Africa, scribbling in a journal each night under a mosquito net by the light of a candle after another child had died. It was an impulse to impose structure, pattern, meaning on the chaos around us, 
lest we be overwhelmed by that rising wave of nihilism that the destruction of lives, adults or children, brought to bear on us. A wave that threatened to snuff out any hope or purpose, much less faith in anything good. In Robert Louis Fowler, I had a grandfather, a linear blood relative, in whom I could see a man with my build, my lean stature, even my hair. In him, I could see my physical self. But Gordon Edward Cross, in the medic photographer turned writer, I could see something more. In Gordon, I heard the voice of an artist, a healer, and my own spiritual kin. I could see myself in his place, in his reactions, I could imagine my own. And I could only hope that, in similar circumstances, I could rise to the occasion as he did. I am deeply grateful that his son Bill shared his story with us. Introduction by William G. Cross Like many combat veterans, Dad never talked much about it. Oh, he'd say a few things now and then, but I was too young to understand or appreciate what he went through, and didn't have the foresight to follow up and have any detailed discussions about his experiences. My mother said that, also like many veterans. He suffered from nightmares years after his return from the war. Dad never thought he'd be drafted, let alone see combat. Once there, he never thought he'd be coming home. Entering the army at the age 38 and trained as an x-ray technician, he felt secure in the knowledge that he'd be attached to some sort of field hospital far from the front. Such was not the case. In 1944, with the war raging in France, there was a constant need for replacements. At the time, anyone with any sort of medical training often got sent right to the front. So it was, he found himself in a foxhole one night with a young soldier who was wishing he were ten years older. Dad inquired why. The young man said he was 20 years old, but had heard that those who were 30 or older were never sent to the front. Dad at the time was 39. He said he didn't have the heart to tell the young man. Drafted in October 1943, Dad became a member of the 35th Infantry Division, a unit that attacked 35 out of its first 45 days in combat. It was a group that suffered over 23,000 casualties during World War II, a level which represents a 180% attrition rate. Originated during the Indian Wars, the men of the 35th wore the Santa Fe shoulder patch, a white cross on a blue field honoring the men who blazed the old Santa Fe Trail. Although he was never seriously wounded, he saw many that were. This diary is edited only for grammatical style and was compiled by my father after the war from bits of paper he carried with him throughout the war in his pack or helmet headband. It represents his words regarding what he experienced as a frontline medic assigned to the 134th Infantry Regiment Medical Detachment between July 1944 and May 1945, from Omaha Beach to the fall of Germany. Part 3 The Photography of Gordon Edward Cross what follows are the photographs of Gordon Edward Cross, taken throughout the time of his deployment in Europe. As a professional photographer, Gordon had his camera on him frequently, but time and safety to take pictures was in short supply. With no darkroom available, he could not develop the pictures until he returned to the States, so the information we have on each photo is scant. The words accompanying each picture read more like titles than captions. But we have done our best to preserve Gordon's voice by leaving them mostly unchanged. The brevity of words itself captures the speed with which the 134th was racing across Europe. From France to Belgium and into Germany, from one battlefield to the next, into one shattered city than another. Gordon's words for the sites and places turned out to be as stark as the bombed out ruins themselves. The desolation, even rendered in black and white, is visceral. The photos of German dead, a torch tank, of shattered homes, churches, factories, form a grim landscape of human-made violence and human-made loss. Ever the artist, Gordon preserved for us more than a series of unrelated or unconnected images. Studying them, a story emerges, 
of young men, foreigners in a strange land, of soldiers doing their duty and encountering Poles, French, Dutch, Belgians, Russians, Germans alike, even forming unexpected friendships in the process. For these young men from small Midwest towns, the cobblestone streets, bucolic villages, medieval cathedrals, expansive chateaus, bombed out or not, would have felt foreign indeed. But there would have been an undeniable familiarity in these settings, too. One can sense a familiar small-town solidarity and rural pace in the villages and countryside that Gordon captures. The feel of these places must have resonated with these Midwestern men in brief respites between the hellfire of battle. The G.I.s must have perceived it when they met the liberated residents, who offered cheers, toasts, pies, and smiles, and sometimes more. I can only imagine that these moments of recognition reminded these men of the 35th Division and the 134th Regiment within it of why they were fighting in the first place. As the guns began to go silent, the rain of bombs stopped falling, and the enemy surrendered, cooperating more often than giving resistance, one sees in Gordon's photos everyday life reasserting itself. It comes in strange juxtapositions. American G.I.s walking amid foot traffic in a narrow medieval street. A farmer leading his oxen past an abandoned anti-aircraft gun. A woman riding a bike through a town square. G.I.s with rifles replaced by civilians with shopping bags. Gordon captures the humanity of people in the midst of, and emerging from, conflict. All these years later, we can bear witness to it, whether in the wary gaze of the photographer as he encounters German prisoners, a female Red Cross worker providing a haircut, a soldier cradling a puppy turned mascot, or an American medic holding a Belgian girl whose skinned knee he has just bandaged. Finally, the pictures of the medics and soldiers' homecoming show a triumphant but bittersweet return. The absence of so many friends and comrades, who had departed alongside but were not there upon return, would have been a heavy burden. Even in the midst of great joy, of these photos, one of the last is most striking to me. It is one Gordon took of the men on deck. The finer details of the shore are lost to focus, the ship still too far out in the harbor to pick out any family members waiting quayside. Before the jolt of return and reunion, you can almost feel their pensiveness. One man lights a cigarette, perhaps to counter his impatience, to calm his nerves, or both. The other men lean over the railing, peering into their home and, I'd like to think, the life ahead of them, as if trying to bring into focus their futures, the way one might look to a crowd of faces on the shore to pick out someone familiar. A brother, a sister, a wife, a child. The people, the places, resolving into the future to which they would belong. For Gordon and his brother Glenn, who had also served in the 35th Division, the years ahead were full ones, with family, work, and success in both. The pictures of Jordan and Glenn and their post-war careers are included here too. The photo of Gordon with his camera on set with Mitch Miller is another favorite of mine. I feel that the expression on Gordon's face captures a hard-earned steadfastness and a well-won confidence. As Gordon holds his camera in the midst of this musical show, I'm reminded once again of that artist's soul that sits within him. It is a big heart that looks out from those eyes. I've also included a last picture of Bill, Gordon's son. In the photo, Bill stands next to a World War II-era jeep he restored. He tells me it was a bit of a weekend hobby, but I see it as more. It's a fitting sign of his stewardship of his father's legacy, and a tribute to the vehicle that carried Gordon across France. I felt it only proper to include it. The photo is a salient reminder, for me, of the role Bill played preserving his father's extraordinary story. The medic's diary is writing that sits on the heart like a bright and burning ember. Its imagery remains top of mind long after reading. The same can be said for the story told through Gordon's photographs and the further shape of his life afterwards. For Gordon and Bill, I'm grateful. May we all be so lucky to rise to the occasion as the men of the 134th did, to go out and face down fear, 
to accomplish the tasks that honor and loyalty put before us, then to return home. May we be lucky enough to gaze out on our lives ahead, like they did on the deck of their homecoming ship, knowing our good deeds are behind us, but many more before us. May we all be as good stewards as Bill, preserving the memory of these men and their generation, lest we forget. Ted Neal Diary of a Frontline Medic, World War II Gordon Edward Cross, 35th Division, 134th Infantry Regiment Florence, my wife, seven months pregnant, was expecting me home for dinner. But suddenly, I couldn't leave up to New York, and even telephone calls were forbidden. When I didn't call, Florence knew I wouldn't be home for dinner for a long time. Our ship, the Dominion Monarch, left New York May 1st, 1944. Crossing the Hudson River on the ferry, I could see our London Terrace apartment building. We marched on board to the strains of Strip Paca, played by a WAC band. Jammed into the mess hall, still wearing ODs with a full horseshoe roll, we were like sardines and hot as hell. Finally, hammocks were slung head to toe as close as possible. During the day, they were rolled and stacked, and I never saw mine again after the first night. The food was poor, and some guys didn't eat half the meals. One fellow I knew lived on candy bars. The 14-day voyage was not bad. We had good weather. Two or three times there were alerts and sub-chasers dropped ash cans around the ship. We gathered we were on a northerly route in a convoy of about 50 vessels. I met Creighton, Bricky, and Dugan. Arrived in Liverpool, Sunday, May 14th, and disembarked to a recording of my old friend Frank Parker singing Begin the Beguin. Loaded onto a tiny train, we traveled to Warminster where we arrived about 11 p.m. Black as pitch. There had been an air raid the night before. We lined up and stumbled about six miles carrying that heavy pack. It was so dark I tied a white handkerchief to the man ahead. The camp was called Chalcouture, Chocolate. It was a tent city, set up that day on the summer place of the sister-in-law of the Duke of Kent. We were handed two blankets and a brand new army cot which we struggled to set up with numb fingers by matchlight. This was May, but I have never been colder. It was penetrating dampness that chilled to the bone. The next morning at daybreak, we were all out scavenging for paper, hay, anything for insulation. At night, we went to bed early and piled all our equipment on top of us to keep warm. Got to talking to a tent mate from Connecticut named George Comer. He knew my good friend and fellow singer, J. Alden Edkins. In fact, Alden was now working on George's uncle's farm in East Haddam, Connecticut. George was destined to become my good friend. The English countryside was lovely. I heard my first cuckoo. Beautiful flowers in the little villages, but cadence marching on the paved roads was for the birds. With luck, I managed to get on as a mail clerk which got me out of the hikes and KP details. My buddy Comer was having real trouble with the hikes, so I managed to get him on the mail detail too. He was most grateful. The small English towns were very attractive in a quaint way, but the shops had nothing to sell but postcards. Tried English ale and stout, decided English teas better than their coffee. Most people very poor by our standards. If a man drove a car, he couldn't afford tobacco. We were assigned to a replacement package. Theoretically, this included the replacements needed by a division in combat. Men began leaving, a few at a time, depending on their specialty numbers. Finally, our package was alerted and moved about 20 miles to Tillshed, forsaken windswept camp which became more pleasant with warmer weather. Creighton, Deeds, and I put on several shows which the boys seemed to enjoy. Deeds did a fire-eating act, played the accordion, and accompanied me on some old chestnuts. Our G.I. show was a big hit. 
spent the early morning hours of D-Day hanging over fences in the woods and lined up before the latrines, which were hopelessly overworked. Overhead, we heard the roar of the planes and sometimes could make out the black and white stripes on the wings. The big attack was on. Moved to a staging area about 6 p.m. July 12th. This is it. We were a bit grim. We'd had inspections all the way along, but here we got final shortages, put on wool ODs with gas-impregnated fatigues over them. Next morning, we moved out to nearby Weymouth, where we could see ships waiting in the harbor. Weymouth seemed nice, and I thought I'd like to arrive under different circumstances. All along, I felt fortunate. I was an x-ray technician headed for an evacuation hospital while the lot of these guys were headed for the front lines. Across the channel at night. Picked up the French coast early in the morning. About noon we reached Omaha Beach, where there was tremendous activity. Boats taking men in, ducks unloading supplies, sunken ships, burned out tanks, barrage balloons... All the grim evidence of war. Went to shore in a small boat. Man just back of me killed himself. And the bullet wounded an officer behind him. On shore, still carrying that huge horseshoe pack, we walked up a long landing platform along a rough sandy beach to a road running parallel to the beach. Waited for our group to assemble, then began to walk. They said it was a couple miles. We walked three. And then they said two miles. Tapes along the track road read, Cleared of mines to ditch. We walked miles, but it was still two more. Now one mile. Now three hundred yards. Just another mile. Finally, we made it. It was an empty field. We'd passed through a couple small French villages where old men and women passed out cider made us feel like the conquering heroes. No mistaking the gratitude of these people. <sighs> I've never been more tired. I spread out a raincoat and slept. Next morning, we took off in trucks. Now we began to see what war was really like. Isigny was one town. Was is right. I never dreamed of such... Destruction. Piles of rubbish, half houses, which were even worse. Trees stripped of leaves look obscene. Fields churned. Here were hundreds of veterans going back to the front, and also a lot of CEs. That means combat exhaustion. Where is that evacuation hospital? No, your spec number won't be changed. They seem to need a lot of medics. All the combat men have 29th or 35th division patches. The 29th came in on D-Day. I heard a couple of vets talking. Sam got it. So did Ed and Pete. And that officer and the staff sergeant. There are about four left out in the whole squad. How lucky I am to be an x-ray. Strange they should need so many x-ray technicians up here. Several of the medics are in x-ray. Air raid. Pretty red balls floating through the air. Keep that helmet on. That is lead and steel floating around up there. Sound asleep. Clang, clang. A gas attack. Dear God, where's that mask? There, I've got it. Oh, you clumsy bastard. How about my hands? Should I try to get into that impregnated clothing? Yelling and screaming from the CEs. Good Lord, they don't have gas masks. What's that sound? The all clear? Thank God. Cross. Dugan. Well, here we go. It's the 35th Division. What's that about spec numbers? Mine is Medical Technician. 
the hell is that? Not a litter bearer, thank heaven. Our truck stops at the 134th Regiment Service Company. You'd better dig in good. There are some holes. There was a raid two nights ago. See that truck and those shrapnel holes? Guy tries to tell us that it isn't too awfully bad. He's a mite doleful Joe, but I guess he means well. I wish he didn't look so sad. Next morning, we move up to regimental headquarters. Small tent in a field. Meet Sergeant Ozzy and Major. The Major seems like a nice guy. You're from New York and a singer? Well, glad to have you. This guy seems smooth. He'll fix me up. I know. We watch a thousand planes strike at St. Lowe. It is wonderful, though we didn't realize how wonderful. Blazovich and Winters go to second, Casey to first, Dugan and Cross to third battalion. Dead cows, swollen horses, stink, trees smashed, fields pockmarked. Along a wooded road into a grove where there's a tent, a jeep, several bicycles, and a half dozen men. There's gunfire close by. How far is the front? All around there, half circle ahead. Why aren't these guys afraid? Some of them are. That guy has a haunted look in his eyes. Another's trembling and... Dear God, he's crying. Captain Matt, battalion surgeon, and our commanding officer has a worried look, too. Well, paint red crosses on your helmets. Now I know there's no x-ray tent. I felt sorry for Dugan, coming up when he said to Sergeant Osborne that it was a shame to spend all the time and money to train a man for x-ray, and then... Third Battalion is in two sections. Dugan and I go to Captain Friedman's section. He seems like a cool duck. Several of the guys seem nice, but a couple are very nervous. You'd better dig in well. Some shelling here. Dugan and I pick out a spot and dig. Whistle. Crack. We hit the dirt. Crack again. Those are 88s and nobody needs to tell us. Dig. Dig. Deeper, deeper. Now a roof, more screaming shells. Dugan and I scramble down and lie trembling. My knees won't stop shaking. That must be all for now. Where did those hit? One in the road, one across above us, and one lower. Wounded coming in. I do what I can. Unfold litters, etc. How those guys rip into that clothing. Scissors slither up a pant leg, rip off a shirt sleeve. Sulfa powder. Carlisle's. What in the hell are Carlisle's? Oh, those paper-covered bandages with the tails on them. Triangles for slings, leg splints, plasma, morphine surrettes. Bob, Cherry, Cross, Jack. Litter squad to the CP. Grab a litter blanket, somebody. Got an aid kit? By jeep for about a mile. That's St. Low. From here on foot. Keep moving. Hit the dirt. Let's go. That building is the CP. This fellow will guide you up. Yeah, it's my buddy. This way. Up through utter desolation. Your mind refuses to believe such destruction. No building not hit. Dead bodies. Through littered streets, into a church, down the front steps. The soldier tells us, He's in the middle of that field over there, about 200 yards. I can't go any further, because we're under observation from here. Well, if they can see us, let's stand up so they can tell we're litter bearers. That's our only chance. Nothing happens. We go on over a wall. Cross piles of rubble. How will we ever get a patient back up this way on a litter? Now we're in the field. 
must be further. There he is. Bandages, morphine. Let's go. We hit the dirt. That's a burp gun. Anybody hit? Christ, we can't stay here. Grab hold and swing right away from that gun. Let's go. My lungs are bursting. Set him down a minute. Change hands. Let's go. Up over the wall. There's the church. Here's his buddy. What in the world were you two guys doing out there? We're from the Navy. We were just looking for some excitement. Same litter squad to the CP. Now set up in a cement crypt in the St. Lo Cemetery. Casualties in outpost up ahead, but because of observation, can't go forward until dark. Now 3 p.m. Climb into a hole in the graveyard, protected by a big headstone. Whistle, crunch. You all right? Kick dirt all over us. More shelling. Thank heaven for a good deep hole. Tombstones over the living. Scream, crunch, that one hit by a stone close by. It's getting dark. Hey, you guys, let's go! One man is missing, but we can't wait. Up this street, turn down to the left. Over the fence, cross the street, through the gate. Quiet, watch the light! Down the stairs into a basement lit by a couple candles. Mattresses along one side. Several guys are hit, and there are only two of us. Well, we'll carry the worst one and lead the walking wounded. Broken leg. My god, he's over six feet. We can't even get him up those steps. But we do. Now back to the CP. Left here, now right. Over that fence, across the field. Down, damn it, they're shelling the road! Run, for God's sake, we can't stay here. Wait, I can't hold on any longer. Rest a minute. Another hundred yards, down again. Sorry, but I can't do any better. Let's go again. Wait, I gotta stop. A mile and a half of this can't be much further. Here's the jeep. Thank God. I've never been so tired in my life. We're going to move up. We pack supplies into packs and move up to that same St. Lo Cemetery and dig in. A shell hits a mausoleum we'd inspected two minutes ago. Now I dig in earnest. What are these bones? I'm a ghoul. Sorry, but the dead must make way for the living. Better one alive than two piles of bones. We continue digging among the graves. We move into town. That's a laugh. There isn't a whole house standing. We captured a bunch of bicycles, so here I am riding and pushing a bike through St. Lo. Dead men, some GIs, caved in earthen sacks. Were these once living men? Bloated, turning black. The smell of death is everywhere. On single file through the rubble. Watch out for booby traps. There's one taped off by the engineers, a Heine pistol. An underground hospital, they say it was trapped with a 500 pound bomb. Bicycles trapped too. Once again to a chateau on the outskirts where our aid station has been set up. Wounded pouring in, litter calls. We go up a street blocked by a blown up tank. Mines everywhere. Under little piles of rock, in the open, some walking wounded. Some casualties up ahead, two wounded. We put one on a litter and half carry the other. It's a long haul. Two more litters. Okay, same trip over again. Dead Heine in a dark green uniform. Looks like a woman to us. Shot out of a tree. It's dark now. Where the hell are those mines? Careful. Two men carry, and one walks ahead to find the path. Jesus, was that a mine? Sure as hell know if it was. Engineers, bulldozers working on the streets. Didn't look as though those streets could ever be used again, but those bulldozers are halfway through already. If they can't push it aside, they go over the top. Ammunition barriers going up all night long. 
Bullets for M1s, bullets for machine guns, like water through a sieve. Bullets, bullets, bullets. We relay the wounded back from the aid station. The ambulances can't get through yet. Back past those dead heinies to the left and the first relief. Dear God, this is only one day of battle. Captain Matt wants you. Cross. I want you to go out to K Company as aid man. Better stock up your aid kits, Sergeant Tomasowitz says. Don't take any unnecessary chances. Take care of yourself. Have you got morphine? Know how to use it? Company K is over there. They're in reserve. Report to Sergeant Brown. I find the sergeant, and he introduces me to Lieutenant... Blank. <laughs> We jump off as Spearhead at one o'clock. The boys are stretched out along a hedgerow. Some are riding, and others are just sitting. The sergeants pass out bandoliers of ammo, hand grenades, three rations. Riding might not be a bad idea. What can you say? What is written seems empty, feeble. But I put it in my helmet band. Five minutes to go. Ready? Let's go. Follow the LT, they told me, so I stay close to the LT's heels. We're over the first hedge and nothing has happened. We move up in a scattered line, still nothing. Suddenly there are shots to the left and then on the right. That's where I and L companies are. On ahead, breathless, tense, alert. Just like a hunt, except this time the game shoots back. Down a little hill, surround a house, nothing here. River, more like a wide creek, ahead. A bridge downstream about 100 yards, but the LT jumps in and wades. They told me to follow, so into the waist and across. Out running through a meadow and halfway across, there's a whistle crack of an 88. Thank heaven I didn't try to make that bridge. Somebody is hit. Last man across. We get him into the shelter of the hill and find it's only a flesh wound in the calf of his leg but I would have been behind him. We move on slowly. It's getting dark, so we dig in around the edges of a small field. The LT comes by to check on casualties, and we walk back towards the meadow, but decide there aren't any more wounded. Back digging again. I'm down about six inches when suddenly the sky lights up. Don't move. I remember if you stand still, they may not see you. Here they come. Where was that big kraut foxhole? Over there. When the flare fades, I run for it. Already seven or eight are in it, but there has to be room for one more. Bombs coming closer all around us. Must have got a lot of our boys. Anybody hurt? No answer. So I take a quick look around and decide we were lucky. Back to the cellar, but no room to lie down. Sit all night with knees under my chin, cramps in my legs, chilling cold. Next morning, find bomb craters in a triangle pattern, not 100 feet from our foxhole. Resume attack at 8 a.m. Tiny hedgerow fields. Never see more than your head. We line up along a sunken road and go over the hedge in four or five different places. We're halfway through a wheat field when they open up. Burp guns and machine guns everywhere. Medic! Medic! It's the lieutenant, hit in the arm, but not bad, and he'll keep going. Another lad close by is nicked, then a man back near the hedge, base of the throat. Large Carlisle. Really hit bad. Have to get him out of here. Arm over my shoulder, half turn, crack, crack. Brains all over me. Great hole in his head. I get over the fence, but I don't know how. We move along the hedgerow, more men hit. Bandage, bandage, bandage. Both aid kits low. Got to get more supplies. Work with other companies along the sunken road. Bandage, morphine, gaping flesh wounds, sucking wounds. The bad ones don't complain, but one kid nicked makes an awful fuss. Must check and see how many litter cases. Go ahead one row, check right, then left. Kid dug in right in the corner of the hedgerow. Move away a few feet and crash. Right in the corner. Run back, but there's nothing I can do. On to the right again, over a hedge, and 
A dead man in every foxhole. Shells must have come from behind. On along the hedge, and there are men standing looking at me. They're not G.I.s. They're Germans. We must be to the right. Run, run, run. Over a hedge, across the field, another hedge, the sunken road. Men in holes here, too. All are dead. Crossfire. Some SPs got behind us, we heard later. This was Bloody Sunday, July 29th. Probably the worst day the 134th ever had. One shell in that road got the Major and four others. Took off the back of his head, but he still lived a little while. Blazovich came in with me. Got it. He was loading an ambulance at the end of the sunken road. The Germans knew exactly where we were on their maps and caught us in a murderous crossfire. We're in reserve. The Heinies seem to be falling back, fighting a rearguard action. We move up slowly, checking every point. Orchard, farm, woods. Dig in whenever we stop. Four or five times a day, always some shelling around dusk. Nothing so chilling as an 88. Whistle, crack, and a crunching, rending sound. Feel like an insect and a blind giant swinging a club at you. Am I scared? You're damn right. There are no atheists here. Must cross at the Voire River. We swing right and go through a narrow pass that hills going up at 45 degrees on both sides. One machine gun could wipe us out, but we see only a couple of scared Germans. Kids probably running away. Find a narrow spot where we cross a ladder, covered by a couple planks. Keep left of the road. Mine's on the right. We're across and start up a steep rocky path, scouts moving ahead. Crack! In 88. We scatter and dig. L Company tries on our right. They've hit something. Machine guns, rifles, burp guns, 50Ms. Quiet again. We're pulling back. There go two medics after L Company casualties. Should I go too? My company's moving. Maybe I'd better stay. Later, I heard both those medics were killed. Back to the road. We go straight up through the woods, dig in, then on again straight over. I follow Joe Kimberly, best soldier I ever saw. Through one field, halfway up another, when all hell breaks loose. That house is a damn pillbox! Medic! Medic! One hit in the arm, another in the leg. Bandage and help to the hedge. Must be more hit. Try putting my jacket on a stick so the red cross can be seen. Start up left side of the field. Crump. 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 Mortars. Walk down the middle of the field. Man hit in foot. Can't walk. Help him back to trail. Where the hell is it? Must be this way. There's some buildings and then a German officer. Run. Run. How could we get lost? Hey, where's that aid station? What outfit is this? The 320th. Where's the 134th? Must be left. Gotta go back. Go along river a long way and finally meet litter bearers. K Company is left and higher back. Black as ink. Up, up. Stumble and fall. Some buildings. K Company is straight ahead 200 yards. Finally find them and go to work on wounded. Two bad and five lightly hit. One boy has broken leg and broken arm. Gotta keep him warm. No blankets, but gather up discarded clothing. Nothing to do but wait for litter bearers. Crash, crash, crump. Whose are those? Ours or theirs? Good God, it's both. Theirs just barely over and ours just clearing us. Never heard anything like this. How can they miss? 2 a.m., the litter bearers, one team and two litters. Aid man Taylor and I carry one. Cross a field over some barbed wire, now down a trail. Feel with your feet. Stagger and slide. Half a mile more and we're on the road. The aid station? Maybe a mile? It was two or three. Silent shapes along the road. Were they GIs? The aid station. It's 3.30 a.m. Tired. 
numb. K Company wasn't wiped out, but they lost 18 men. Open country again. Jerry's falling back. We're moving somewhere on trucks. The 35th getting a rest? Rest. Hell, it's a long move. We're on the wrong road. Planes overhead, strafing and bombing. Bombing the road we should have been on. Cross, I'm taking your place. You go into the aid station. Nice, clean-cut kid named Snowbreak from Minnesota. Killed in the attack his first day. He took my place. Morphine, bandages, sulfa, splints. Faster, there are so many. Hurry, move them back. Time may save their lives. This is not x-ray, but it's a reprieve from being an aid man. We didn't know at the time, but Mortrin was a huge trap. The Fallet's pocket. We were the stopper. An important victory and the end of one phase. It's Sunday, and we're resting. I remember singing Abide With Me for the chaplain's service. A lot of men never paid much attention to church before. The Germans are falling back, and we are moving rapidly by jeep. It's just like the movies. Crowds line the small town streets, waving flags and throwing flowers, apples, plums. Leo rolls cheese cans down the road, and we laugh as the kids scramble for them. People try to shake hands, throw kisses. It's exhilarating. But I keep thinking there must be a camera somewhere. Le Mans tops everything. This is a big town, and it's delirious. Street cafes, curbs, swarming pretty girls. Meki are a big help now. They know the country and where the Heinies are. The Germans are disorganized here. We capture replacements who do not know where the front is. Stop at Aixenot while the woods are cleared ahead. Thousands of prisoners. Rest. The mayor of Le Mans gave us fresh eggs and a black and white puppy for a mascot. Another sudden move. Stop on battlefield of First World War. Old trenches, rusted bayonets, parts of rifles, gas masks. Advance on foot under scattered shelling. I receive a letter from my wife, Florence. Tells me we have a beautiful daughter, Carol, now a month old. Her picture looks like one of my baby pictures. Set up aid station in a beer parlor. Bed down. Get orders to move at 10.30 p.m. It's black as hell. How can the driver see... Seems we're following the 2nd Battalion. They've crossed the Mosul on a bridge and have been trapped, bridge blown behind them. Out of the darkness, a jeep with a wounded man. Get him on a litter and work under blankets for blackout. He's hit hard, broken leg. Must get him to the hospital. Captain Matt points where the hospital should be and we move over crooked country roads, back through two villages. Here's where we are. Turn right along the railroad. Can this be right? Up a hill through a village. Should be here, but it isn't. Back to the aid station. Try to make patient more comfortable. Check maps and try again. This time after three hours, we make it. Thank goodness, somebody has a bottle. Daylight, we catch up. Jeeps are off-road just above Mosul. Shelling. Got to find cover. Left a half mile or deep woods. Dig in. One boy cut off with 2nd Battalion comes in. He hid all day in the brush watching German tanks and gun emplacements. At dark, we swim river. Take him to Lieutenant Colonel. He was cited later for this. Outposts and buildings along road leading to bridge. Under terrific shell fire. Litter call. Nothing to do but make a run for it in the jeep. Trees cut bare by shrapnel. Branches on the road, but we get through. One man in ditch, two in basement. Heavy shelling. Get one out, then the other. Shells bracket road behind us, but we're lucky. Swing up river toward Nancy, which we take without too much trouble. Heine artillery catches us on a narrow street, but our luck holds. Set up aid station in former schoolhouse. French band comes down the street. Snipers still shooting. Old gent on a bicycle. Crump. Crump. The old man is down. The band hits the dirt, but nobody's hurt. 
all come back gesticulating wildly and covered with dirt. Our infantry is attacking across the river and up the hill. Throw in white phosphorus. 50 millimeter machine guns chattering. Darkness. Big fuss about a casualty down on the river. Struggle through rubble and wade in for him. Turns out to be a jerry with a light wound. Terrific haul to the top of mountain. Move slowly, carefully. May be under observation. Pick up three litter cases. One medic lay all night in a ditch, but not a whisper. Knew we'd come. Improvise litter from cellar door. Slip, slide, stumble. We're down again. Sugarloaf. A death trap. Open round, snow-covered knob. Trifrontal attack, mowed down. Finally circle and secure top, but at a terrible cost. Spot a wounded Heine lying in a field. Major Wood goes with us to get him. It's a GI, hit bad, but he's crawled over a mile. Out there all night and all day, but still strong. These kids have guts. Wants a cigarette and water. Move forward, slowly. Use back roads. Main roads are mined or blocked. Dig in. Wait. Then move into a small town knocked to hell by planes. Heavy fighting in our right. Towns burning. Field littered with German dead. Allen Court. Gramercy Woods. We're in a holding position. Aid station is in a big stone wine cellar. Hear a voice. Well, the old bastard looks about the same. It's my brother Glenn, hale and hearty. I haven't heard from him since before D-Day. Didn't know whether he was alive or dead. His outfit is in Nancy, and I go back to spend the night with him. Weeks before, one of his buddies had found my pack in a field, but never told Glenn. Now they'd seen our wagon wheel patch, and knew our regiment was in the area. Glenn borrowed a jeep to run us down. Stopped to ask a sentry what was ahead. Germans. He turned around and finally found us. Our stone cellar was quite safe, but one morning a goose took a direct hit. Later the OP was shelled and a guard was hit in the throat. He came running, the blood spurting. Captain Matt managed to clamp the artery, but the boy died on the way to the clearing company. One morning, snipers and burp guns sounded only yards away. Piper Cubs spotted the enemy forming in a field in the woods and called the location to our mortars, who miraculously had the spot zeroed in. These mortars saved us from capture. Here, a shell dropped in front of LaSalle, a California boy who had volunteered to be an aid man. Again, we moved up slowly through mud and water. Six consecutive aid stations were hit by shellfire, but luckily no one was injured. Captain Matt was spanked in the backside by a piece of shrapnel which came through a wooden wall and his sleeping bag. Mortars hit the room adjoining them as we worked over casualties and blew off the roof onto our trailers. On the move again, we were narrowly missed by 88 several times. Nothing can paralyze your mind like that scream, crunch, of an 88. Bloody Monday, Hill 108. We handled 138 casualties that day. The men were caught crossing a bald hill, mowed down. I had a boy emptying the water bucket where I washed my bloody hands as I worked over casualties. Flint and I set up a forward aid station. Casualty reported up ahead, but directions were vague. Jeep returns after two hours. Got as far as a blown out bridge. Tried again in an hour and brought back a lad with a broken leg. Wounds right side, liver region, and upper lung. Freezing cold with faint pulse. We did all we could until the ambulance came, but I knew this one would never make it. St. Jean. The convoy was cut by 88s and our trailer hit twice. I scrambled among some blocks of stone. Forrest was hit. Shrapnel through a door in a basement cut the clothing from his arm and shoulder. Luckily, only a flesh wound. Forrest came back later. That night, it seemed impossible that the convoy wasn't smashed. 
The litter bearers followed tanks in attack and Dugan was hit. Wasn't too bad, but Dugan never came back. The tankers had a rough day, caught in the open by artillery. Poutelange, 2nd Battalion, jumped off in the dark, waded a swollen river and captured the Heinies in their foxholes, advanced through rough country over roads where even the jeeps stalled. Approached the Saar and the Heinies fell back desperately. The Saar was a natural barrier, which they knew how to defend. Our riverbank was wide open and all bridges blown, but the infantry found what was left of a railroad bridge and made it across under a terrific pounding. The fighting moved on, but a stray mortar killed Tommy Tomasowitz. Tommy, who told me not to take any unnecessary chances. Tommy, who never shirked anything. He was a section sergeant and could have stayed further back. Combat engineers, trying to put in a bridge under direct fire. Phil and I answer the call. A run by jeep for a mile or so on an open road above the river. Major waved us under a railway viaduct during the burst of shelling. As it slackened, we ripped across a canal and doubled back 100 yards to the bridgehead, where the engineers were huddled behind a pitiful little jumble of masonry and girders. Two more barrages screamed in. We piled on five wounded men and Thill took off as far as our cargo and the bombed roads would permit. Just got away when the shelling began again. Fifteen men, including the Major who directed us in, were hauled away from that bridge. My hat is off to the combat engineers. Across the Saar, we found our ex-mess sergeant drunk one night. He fired at a German plane with an M1. Could have brought on a bombing raid, so he was sent to a line company. Got tanked up whenever possible. One day, he started after a tank with a grease gun chattering. When a mortar got him. The move from the Saar to the Blees was one of the weirdest we ever made. Black as ink, over barely passable muddy roads with gun flashes splitting the darkness. Up around a burning house, a devil's torch which must have been visible for miles. Set up aid station in a surprisingly good house, well built. Interesting decor. Tiny stayed behind to guard the supplies we couldn't take. Tiny, always careful, never took any chances if he could help it. Stopped a couple days at Regimental before he caught up with us. I was sitting by the telephone talking to the chaplain when there was a terrific explosion across the street. Six feet from us in a hall, a plate-sized piece of shrapnel sliced through Tiny's head. Big, fun-loving, careful Tiny. Nothing in ten months shook me like this. It was also too much for Cat and Matt. Tiny had been his man Friday. Salt boats arrived too late for the third to cross the Bleas. But the first got over and the third followed. Bitter fighting here, for the Heinies were on higher ground. Newspaper correspondents got a taste of evacuation when Thill took one down the river there. Our boys worked under a Red Cross flag with some German medics. Several times they helped us and then returned to their lines. About 9 p.m. the aid station got a call. Troops pulling out of the village had a wounded man. Jerry and I start out in the jeep. It's pitch black and we're in the ditch in 50 yards. Ambulance pulls us out. We crawl along a muddy track to main road to turn off and for two miles I walk in front of the jeep to find the road. Pouring rain, deep mud, sporadic shelling. Finally, we find five men with bad feet and one with a strained back. They're having a feast of fried ham and potatoes. The rest of the troops are gone, and they're positive they took the wounded man. Two miles of mud and water to the main road, and another mile to that burning house where the tankers are. It's 2 a.m. Their surgeon gives us a snifter. Back at the aid station, another hour, and there's a call threatening Captain Matt with court-martial if that man isn't picked up. We're too beat to go back, so another crew starts off. They got their man. He'd shot himself in the foot. The officer who threatened Captain Matt did the same thing later on. The Bleas. 
Our aid station is in a basement room at the end of a bridge the Heinies are trying to knock out. Several civilian refugees, including a German girl, play guitar and sing pennies from heaven. We're in French territory, but across the river is Germany. Finally, the Heinies are pushed back up the hill and we move over into Germany to an advanced aid station Ozzy and the boys have set up. Ozzy is sick, and Flint takes over. Buildings are flimsy, but the shelling's almost directly at the bridge. I come down with something, which the surgeon says is pneumonia, but I persuade them not to send me in, as I might not get back to the outfit again. Sulfa and a few days in bed seem to knock it out. Another outfit is taking over and we pull pack across the biles. Day and night chatter of a machine gun covering a pillbox. Intermittent shelling. One man killed around the corner. Another hit bad. New replacements get baptism. One is a master sergeant who's goofed somewhere and this is his punishment. He's really scared. Fighting here is fierce and promises to get worse, with Germans holding on to Saarbrücken desperately. Word of their breakthrough in the north doesn't sound good. A long move, the whole division. Bitterly cold, mountains dark and forbidding. Keep interval, watch for planes. The 137th was strafed on the move. Sign reads so many miles to Metz. This has to be the bulge. We stop at Metz for Christmas in barracks and have a wonderful turkey dinner. Bill Brown, Lundmerk, Walderer, and I harmonize on White Christmas, and Sergeant Marco stuffs us with turkey. Metz is a part of the Maginot Line. Forts all around, guns pointing the wrong way. Move on north, Luxembourg, and Belgium. Baston is somewhere ahead. The armor has broken through. Ambulance after ambulance speeds by. It's a winter wonderland. We set up in the summer palace of King Albert of Belgium. Beautiful stone chateau. Thank God for the stone as buildings hit several times. But we're inside. The infantry is out in the snowdrifts. It is bitter cold. Senle is knocked to hell. Old man with hands tied shot to death. Many civilians died in fire. Half a mile from Chateau, German mortars hit a barn full of GIs. Twenty hurt bad, two killed. Every man except medics is armed. Jerry's closing in. We make plans to run for it. Tank and half-track guns chatter all around us. One German tank is hit, and medics bring in five wounded. Sentry detects movement in woods, calls for artillery, and we find thirteen dead, including three artillery observers. Minutes more and they would have been calling big stuff in on us. Through the woods about a mile and a half is Lutherbois. We trade it back and forth several times. Artillery catches eleven Heine tanks lined up in a row. Planes get eight more. Bless those Piper Cub observers. Wounded civilians in Lutherbois. We've got to get them out. We go in at night. At the edge of the woods, we sweat out a barrage, then start across an open field. Woo, 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 screaming mimmies. Express train through the air, blood curdling. Keep away from the path, it's mined. The people are in one big basement. One hiney, seven civilians. I help an old lady about seventy-five, her pitiful belongings wrapped in a tablecloth. She slips and slides, goes to her knees a dozen times as I half carry her up that twisting icy trail. It's bitter cold, but I'm dripping wet. More shells, more mimmies, and then here's the jeep. We've made it. One of the survivors is a girl. She hesitates, then strips off her dress. She's hit in the side. Her father's arm is green and stinks. Sulfa, bandage, and on to collecting. Lutherbois is finally ours. Dead men piled like cordwood. These heinies are SS men. Some of our boys found with 38s shoved down their throats. One of our aid men, learner from Brooklyn, didn't make it back. 
The 137th relieves us, and we rest for two days, then swing in a pincer on woods behind Lutterbois. Beautiful barrage as infantry and tanks advance, forcing SS to fall back. We push the highway and are pinched out. Bitter weather. One boy crawled into the station, his feet blocks of ice. While I worked on his feet, he tells me his buddy standing behind me is nuts. He's holding a rifle butt in his hands. We talk him into taking some blue bombers, and he's out like a light. Whew. Walking outside the aid station, I hear a shot close by. A G.I. has shot himself in the foot. One replacement claims he can't see. The first sergeant determined the man was faking, handed him a rifle, saying, There is no one between you and the Germans. You'd better see. Blasted, burned out U.S. armor everywhere. Stacks of dead waiting to be hauled away. This is by far the worst U.S. disaster we have seen. The enemy was trying to get gasoline and was stopped only some hundreds of yards from one of the biggest fuel dumps in Europe. Hitler's last big gamble didn't quite make it. From the bulge, we moved down near Lynn, Belgium for a brief rest period. On up over a great snowy waste into Hooperdang on our river while we sit and look at the heinies on the other side. This was a holding position, but our outpost catch murders fire occasionally. A bomb leveled half the building the aid station is in. Two dead oxen and a police dog ripening in spite of the cold. The 1st of February, we were relieved and swung north through Belgium into Germany through a British section where we saw the devastating results of the British attack. In what had been a handsome border town... Not an undamaged building remained. Fields dotted with shell holes and dead cattle. Mines everywhere, with only a narrow track cleared. On ever-greasy, horrible roads in streaking rain to Randerdath on the banks of the Roar, which was at flood state because of a blasted dam upstream. Here we sat for almost three weeks under heavy shell fire, waiting for the floods to abate. Apparently, the Germans were using huge slag piles for observation. Our aid station was in a thin shell of a building, and we usually had chow inside. One morning, after heavier shelling than usual, Sergeant Ozzy had it put inside. Fergie decided to go outside to eat when a terrific explosion rocked the whole building. A big 240 millimeter landed in the street 40 feet from the door, Fergie was 20 feet from the blast, but miraculously the shrapnel went up and over his head. He wasn't scratched, although one eardrum was damaged. Across the street, First Sergeant Hill, looking out the window, caught the blast in the face. He lost an eye. Here, we heard our first V-bombs. The motors sounded like huge, souped-up motorcycles. We held our breath, hoping they'd keep going over. One night, one cut out suddenly. Silence. Then a jarring blast. Two miles away, this one wiped out a gun emplacement, killing five men and leaving a hole big enough for a house. This area was dotted with German pillboxes. One day I counted fifteen without moving an inch. Finally. The flooded roar went down, and we jumped across. That day, Conger crawled out to a wounded buddy lying in a ditch. He couldn't apply the bandage in the ditch, so in spite of the pleadings of the man, he sat up on the edge and worked. Sniper's bullet caught him in the side. He was brought in, apologizing for not doing a better job. Conger came through okay, but the doctors told him an inch one way would have hit his spine, and an inch the other way would have hit his liver. Either would have been curtains. The Heine troops here were a ragtag lot and surrendered in droves, but they had sowed mines like wheat. One hour, I took care of two men with feet missing. Here we worked with some colored tankers who were terrific. 
It was their first time in combat, and they just barrel assed. Those boys did a wonderful job. One night move I will never forget. No moves were good, but night moves were always bad. You crept along, stopped, crept some more, stopped. Sure, all the time, any minute, the Heinies would find the convoy strung out like sitting ducks. This night we moved like a snail with terrific cannonades lighting the horizon, sudden flashes. Screaming mimmies moaned and we hit the ditch. Only, there wasn't any ditch. No cover at all. Shells screamed overhead and plowed the field just short of us. A route guide helped us by saying, They're shelling the next turn. At that turn, the convoy stalled. Just ahead, a shell crashed and an anti-tank gunner was killed. Slowly, we crawled, finally reaching a shack glorified into an aid station. At least we were inside, but there were 29 men in two small rooms and a tiny basement. I finally slept on a pile of potatoes, certainly the worst bed I ever had. The shelling was almost continuous. Usually one could identify our own guns, but that night, they all sounded like German guns. The infantry pushed off at dawn, sending back long lines of dejected supermen. <laughs> at an advance station, the boys heard a murderous creeping barrage coming in on the flank. It ripped, tore, and plowed the earth until not a living thing survived. From that direction, it couldn't be ours. Was it German? The boys watched, fascinated, and almost danced when they saw Canadian infantry advancing through the smoke. That afternoon, I rode over some of that area and have never seen such unbelievable destruction. Orchards were jagged snags and fields were churned raw earth. This was the Wessel Pocket where, together with the Canadians, we finally pushed the Heinies across the Rhine. Now came a real, honest-to-God, ten-day rest period at Brook, back near the edge of Holland where we played softball, went to Liege, and saw our crazy jeep driver Thill get his coup de gras. We had radios or speakers in every room. I helped organize a battalion show and soaked up the sunshine. March 25th. We started moving east again. The Rhine was ahead and we knew it had been crossed somewhere. Ammunition lined the road for miles. In the early afternoon, it got smoky, and we suddenly thought of smoke screens. It was murky dusk when we stopped, apparently just short of the Rhine, and heard there were pontoon bridges ahead. Tracers fingered the sky, and red balls of anti-aircraft floated lazily overhead. When do we cross? Tonight. This is it. The last big barrier where the Germans must fight or lose. From Normandy on, this has been our goal, and here it is. We moved up slowly in trucks, jeeps, gun carriers, and on foot over a slight rise, and ahead was the baleful glare of a huge searchlight poking straight away. What the hell is that? Perfect target but the light was up the river, and against it we could suddenly see our way, that narrow black thread, a murky torrent, tiny silhouetted figures directing the troops waiting to cross. We're on the pontoon bridge. Overhead a plane roars and strafes. Red dotted lines rise and fall in the blackness. Red balloons float up and away. Ahead riflemen are shooting into the water. Is it boats? Mines? Jerry Frogman? The riflemen kneel and shoot at anything that moves. We're across and up the other side. There's a roar and the hideous chatter of strafing machine guns. The roaring death is diving. It's over and away. We've scattered like quail and nobody's hit. Ahead, a whole town is burning, and we creep through like ghouls. Shells smashing ahead. We swing left to black buildings where we set up the station and gratefully spread our blankets. At daylight, we move on again. A wrecked American tank with the tanker's body smoldering beside the turret. 
He helped knock out a whole Heine artillery battery before they got him. 200 yards away are a dozen 88s surrounded by dead Heinies. A steady stream of wounded. Scissors, sulfa, bandages, splints, and morphine. After dark, we push through horrible bogging and under shrieking shellfire to an isolated farmhouse. In the morning, there are two little German girls, horribly wounded. One has a piece of black shrapnel where her eyes should be. Dried, bloody bandages sticking from torn flesh. There would be no war if people could see this, or those boys who came in one morning with no faces. From forehead to chin, there was nothing. One could still talk, and you could see his throat and larynx move. The flesh that had been a face hung in a bloody, swinging flap. The 35th is pressing in on the northern edge of the Ruhr Valley, which is a scattered forest of smokestacks as far as the eye can see. And we see more evidence of the terrible efficiency of our bombs. There's an awful sameness to Germany's industrial cities. The heart of each is a smashed, burned out, a desolation of twisted steel and ruptured masonry. At Gladbeck, thousands of civilians are huddled in a coal mine. Women, children, and old men seeking shelter in the dripping, smelly black tunnels. Kirchen has been hit hard. Day's civilians can't understand what has happened. To escape shellfire, we burst into a house where the owners try to argue. What kind of dopes do they take us for? That Mosul wine they didn't offer us was delicious. The Nazi headquarters next door provided a field day for souvenir hunters. Guns, knives, swords. Ray got a beautiful shotgun. Chappie, brand new 45. Nazi souvenir shop had every Heine emblem you ever saw. They are not exactly saleable items now. Bochum is knocked to pieces. The center of the city, a tumbled wasteland with a few cellars still habitable. We push the Germans across the river and pull back to Bores, which is in on the Harnens Canal. There's a slave labor camp there, a mine where we find some pitiable human wrecks wasted by disease and starvation. Vacant faces, dead eyes. The contractor, who should have been feeding these prisoners, had been selling the food on the black market. Pop Mertens, who speaks fluent German, goes through a tunnel into the town and finds it is held by a small group of Heines. The civilians want to surrender. A wrecked railroad span is bridged by one of the boys swimming across, towing a boat into the break. To the right, the engineers have gotten a Bailey bridge across under a smoke screen. Finally, we're squeezed out as the rear pocket shrinks, and we take off on a long, motorized move eastward. We're traveling through territory already taken, and the most striking sight is DPs thronging the roads. Literally, thousands of people are on move on the foot, carrying their meager possessions on their backs or pulling small wagons. Larger wagons stacked with pooled possessions are pushed or pulled by eight to ten people. Sometimes an antique tractor tows three or four wagons, and there's a sprinkling of ancient cars crawling along with blowout and engine trouble at every turn. French, Dutch, Poles, Russians... Ragged, suffering humanity, but smiling and happy to be free and going home. An advance party tears into a town and is stopped by German sentries. Our boys do some fast talking. The German soldiers want to quit, but their officer wants to fight. He finally agrees to surrender to a ranking officer. We stay overnight in a small village, and as we're loading up next morning, there's a roar of planes. Heine planes. Our ak, ak begins to chatter as two go over, and a third blooms smoke, and a parachute billows as the plane noses straight toward us. We scramble for shelter as the plane crashes a hundred yards away. 
No bombs aboard, thank God. But machine guns still crackle for a while. The Elbe River, 60 miles to Berlin. We hear the second armored got across and were chopped up. Crossing here could be rough. Finally, we get the word. This is a holding position. We are to wait for the Russians. Dear God, we've made it. The worst has got to be over. A few shells, a couple of raids, but this is a holding position. We wait here. The Germans attack at another point. They crossed and came in behind our position, but the boys were on their toes, and of the raiding party, 20 were killed, 20 wounded, and 20 captured. Among the seriously wounded was a 15-year-old boy who was second in command. He said he'd been in our village watching the boys play football. If anyone looked suspicious, he would ask for a cigarette. We wait for the Russians to breach Berlin, and now the only thing that matters is points. <sighs> Thank God for five battle stars, my wife and daughter at home, and my age. The war is over for me, and soon I... Conclusion by William G. Cross Dad was one of the lucky ones who made it back safely from the war. A singer in New York doing spots on live radio prior to entering the service, he returned to continue his singing career while moving and settling in East Haddam, Connecticut. A decade and a half later, still involved in music, he, along with his brother Glenn Cross, who is also mentioned in the diary, became two of the 25 men who made up the chorus for the popular early 60s television show Sing Along with Mitch. Dad enjoyed his work very much, and in his later years seemed to be content to live a peaceful, quiet life in the beautiful countryside surrounding his East Haddam home. He passed away in 1973. He survived by his daughter, Carol Cross, and son, Bill Cross, of East Haddam, Connecticut, as well as two granddaughters, Kelly Cross and Caitlin Cross.